Good afternoon, I'm Carl Garth and welcome to our latest edition of the Champion Chat with Councillor Alison Champion. Good afternoon, Alison. How are you today? Hi, Carl. Happy to be here. Thank you for asking as always. How about you? I'm doing well. Uh, big Anzac weekend and uh, let's just say that it's taken a couple of days for my brain to catch up. Okay. And you're here now. I'm here now. <laughs> Getting firing, ready to go. This week, Alison will also be joined by councillors Tom Malikin and soon also councillor Grotti will join us uh, during the uh, podcast. Welcome, Tom. How are you today? I'm good, as usual. Um, when, when you're young, how else would you be? That's it. That's it. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm well, thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Well, councillors, we find ourselves in the midst of a federal election. We've got media saturation 24-7, which I'm sure if uh, it hasn't desensitised us yet, it will. Uh, promises from both major parties, but the very real possibility that some of the smaller parties could end up holding the balance of power after the election, bringing potentially more policy compromises and a much harder job for an elected government to run. How are your thoughts on that? Mm. Do you want to go first, Alison? Um, you're welcome to go first. I don't mind. <laughs> well, we sort of already have that situation. If you look at the coalition, which is a coalition, mm. and the tensions that are running there in between you know, nationals and, and the liberals, but they've also got the same problem as Labor have got, mm. that they're trying to be everything for everybody. And instead of showing leadership and saying this is what we're doing, they keep saying, well, no, we've got a broad church of supporters and members and we listen to everybody, which basically means we'll say one thing in one electorate and another thing in another electorate. And that's very confusing. And as, as a businessmen say, we want certainty. And, you know, we don't care what the policy, well, they do care to some degree what the policies are, but we want, we want policy certainty so we can make our decisions based on what the policies are. Mm -hmm. The policies keep changing. There's no certainties. Businesses will not commit funds for investments. So that policy uncertainty is certainly hurting us and it's hurt us for a long time. We've seen today just the increase in power costs and, you know, the, because of uncertainty, people won't invest because of uncertainty. So we need certainty. And I think that gets back to the basic problem when you, you talk about the number of people who are disinterested in politics and show little attention. It's, it's because I don't think... Um, not, it's a bit, mate, mate, I don't think we've got any real leaders out there and particularly, you know, I don't want to pick on anyone in particular, but then we see what's happening in the New South Wales Liberal Party. It's quite clear that they would they would give up be the Liberal Party having win a federal election to not allowing Scott Morrison to control their, their branch of the Liberal Party. So the people in the Liberal Party are openly doing things that reduces their electoral chances because... because they see that Scott Morrison's put his people in certain key seats. And if they're successful and they form government, he's basically taking over the Liberal Party in New South Wales, and they don't want that. Mm. So, and then similar things have happened in the Labor Party. So you can understand why, and I keep thinking back to the, some of the great leaders of the past, that this didn't happen. You didn't, both sides, great leaders in the past on both sides did not have members of their own party or their own branches sabotaging their electoral chances. It just didn't happen. But that's what's happening now. There's a couple of great points you've touched on there, Tom, and we will actually delve into them definitely uh, in the rest of this podcast because uh, I think they are important. Um, <coughs> Alison, would you like to share your views? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to um, agree with the comment that Councillor Tom just mentioned about the concept of leadership. Um, I, I, the last couple of years really have tested not only us as people, as residents, as citizens, uh, but also all our leaders and their role at all levels. We have been tested. And I think as a result of the last couple of years and our way of living, coping, surviving, managing. We have met many, many, many residents, I think, have a different view 
of our leaders across the board, whichever party, doesn't matter which party. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just getting, I'm getting the feeling in, in, um, in Sherbourne and in our area that no one's really definite about, or not, sorry, not no one, that's not correct. There are people who are what we call the rusted on Liberal, Labor, Greens. Okay, so you'll have those. There are those. But there are the swinging voters. There are going to be some swinging voters this year, I think, uh, more than there have been. And I think the last couple of years um, has, has created that. And... It would, I think, I think we would see something different this time round if we didn't have the lifestyle of the last couple of years. Mm. We are really looking at now who's a leader, who out of the last couple of years has really shown leadership, whether we like it or not, but has really shown leadership, uh, and that's what's going to test us. The other thing I think that um, what I'm looking at as well is things like language uh, and. Mm. how each of the candidates is coming across to us mm. to, to win us over or convince us and, you know, what their attitude is. And through that, we just get what their attitude is. We, we have to. It's the only, you know, unless we meet, the, meet, them, meet them at an event or in the street or, you know, a rally or whatever, um, we get from them what they've written, whether it's social media or whether it's in the letterbox. I, I, pull them stuff, I get stuff in my letterbox and I pull it out and I read it. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, this, this year will be fascinating. I think it will be, there will be something this year that will be fascinating. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really interesting to hear both of you talk about this because you both touched on two very clear points. One, the lack of leadership in unity. And two, the lack of a clear, consistent message. Mm -hmm. Now, in the last federal election, one of the things where uh, Labor's Bill Shorten came uh, a bit of a cropper, was he was up in Carmichael in Queensland saying one thing to them and saying completely the opposite down in the southern states about the Adani mining, et cetera. Mm. Now, you've got to wonder about some of the political savvy of these parties when they are falling into the same uh, traps again in this election, saying one thing in one electorate, another in another, and... Obviously, they've got the thought that either we're A, too lazy or B, don't have access to technology and communications platforms and we won't find out that they're doing double talk, so to speak. Uh, so you've, you've, you've really got to wonder, are they simply lazy, taking us for a ride, or, to be honest, don't care? No, I, I think if you look at Albanese, he's learnt from Short because Short had a lot I think some people say nine policies that were contentious and he was pushing. And if you dis disagreed with any one of those nine policies, and they were fairly broad, uh, negative mm -hmm. gearing, franking credits, um, NDIS, there's a whole range of things that he put forward. And if you disagreed with any one of those nine, and let's face it, if you're putting forward nine, there's going to be one you might not be fully on board with. That was a reason not to vote for it. Mm. So... I think Albanese thought, well, I'm not going to do that. So part of it, the criticism we've had of Albanese is he's the same as Scott Morrison. He says the same things. <laughs> we, we haven't really, when people say we haven't got a choice, is they're not really offering us a different vision. And I think that's part of the disappointment. There's, um, and as you said before, um, part of the, you know people look for people with vision. You may not agree with them, but if they've got a, a clear plan. But I think if you look at the clear plan is to win the election. That's that's what everything's geared towards, winning the election. It's not putting forward a vision or aspirations or hope or, or a clear pathway of where we want to get to. It's how do I win this election? And that was clear in the budget when, you know, the, main, the centrepiece of the budget was a, to a half, half the petrol size, petrol excise for six months. Like, how is that setting a vision for a future? And yet, and that was clearly shaped around the budget. So every around the um, the election. So every every decision, everything is talking about how do I win this election? It's so short term, and I think that's what's turning people off. It is incredibly short term, 
And then the, the other thing that's happening is we look at the minor parties, Paul and Hanson's of the world and um, United Australia and all this sort of thing. Well, I keep saying to people, anyone that thinks that Clive Palmer cares about you and your family has got to be kidding themselves. Like he doesn't care about his own family, I don't think. So to think that he's out there and he's come up with these, you know, it sounds good, 3% interest rates. He never says how he's going to achieve that. Yeah, and I if he forces the banks... I think we find a very doing? similar... Um, I think we find a very similar stance there with a lot of those smaller independent parties. They make these great sound bites or, and in some cases, they might have a world-worthy vision and absolutely no plan how to get there without devastating families and incomes or economies. And then we've got Pauline Hanson, who I was talking about a person I know from Queensland recently who reckons she's in real trouble in Queensland. But she's now come out and announced in certain critical seats in Tasmania she's going to give her preferences to the Labor Party. And then you just sit back and think, well, she's doing that because she likes the Labor Party candidates in Tasmania better. She's probably never met them. Or is the Labor Party policy in Tasmania more aligned with Pauline Hanson's policies? And the answer is no. She's doing that because she dislikes Morrison. So in key seats, she's going to preference Labor. How is that setting out, this is my principles, this is what I stand for, but I dislike him, so I'll, I'll give me preferences to them. Well, yeah. you're so childish and, and immature. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. But that's what's happening. You know what? I think we should, uh, let's, let's get into a little bit about some of these current, um, uh, I'll, I'll call them attitudes uh, across the board. And but before we do that, let's also acknowledge that Australia's got a pretty good democratic system. I believe even though that there is, um, you know, the voting, voting is supposed to be mandatory, we would still have a rather large turnout previously. I think in the last couple of elections, we've really hurt ourselves. But historically, in other great democracies like the US, they only get 50% turnout. You know, um, and if we look at the Australian Electoral Commission, Informal voting in, has doubled from 1977 to 5% after the 2016 election. Now, we can still say, well, 5% is only a, a small number, but mm -hmm. it's still a doubling of the number. 20% um, of people believe that who people vote for won't make any difference. And that's up, that's up from 17% in uh, 2013. Mm. Okay. Only 30% of respondents took a great deal of interest in the 2016 federal election. That's down from 33% in 2013. So what that's telling us is, uh, I think you, you both touched on it a little bit before, people are becoming tired because they're not feeling as though there, there is a change. So my question to you is, would you say that there appears to be a problem with our overall democratic process and does our process itself need overhauling? Uh, I think that's actually something that does need to be considered seriously. Just off the back of, of Tom's comments about um, preference, the preferences, um, I often hear the line, I'm sure other people do, oh, a vote for the Greens is a vote for Labor. So automatically, just because of history, automatically communities think it doesn't matter whether I vote Greens or Labor, it's the same thing. So where's the difference? Um, and that sort of thing then leads to the complacency um, or the lack of trust or the disinterest um, and these statistics that you've just referred to, Carl, they're just increasing percentages of people just not voting or donkey voting or being disinterested and considering that we have a new generation now coming through this year of 18 year olds um, of whom you know my son is one this is his first election I haven't had the conversation yet at all at this point <laughs> and I know um, you know one of one of my network uh, I was actually I caught up with her during the week and she's in the same boat except that she is trying to help her kids understand what the processes are, who's what party, what they stand for, what and do those values line with you, align with you. Um, so, it, you know, it, 
it is it's challenging in a few in a lot of ways at the moment. Uh, so those statistics of that are increasing of, of um, disinterest, unfortunately, are not surprising, and they probably do show that our whole process needs to change. Uh, if we didn't have the preference vote or the preferential voting, what would that look like? Yeah. So we know that in Jaga Jaga, for example, we have, I think it's about eight candidates running at this stage, mm -hmm. registered and running. Um, they're all different. They're all different parties. And um, when you go on to each of their websites and, you know, you click on, look at the websites, um, you get a variety of information. Um, one, you go straight to, say, the One Nation Party and you get all One Nation's candidates and some don't have photos. Uh, and then you would go to, you, there's another candidate you go to, you have a read and you learn about their history and why they're here and who they are and their family, um, but you don't get really much about values. Um, and then there's another, there are other candidates you go to, click on the website, you go straight to them, you hear all about them, you read all about them and, and what they've achieved and what their values are and what their policies are and what they want to, you know, what, how, how they see us moving forward. So there's a great variety there. If you don't, as a, as a resident, if you don't have enough information to justify voting for someone and somebody else does have justification, you might go to that candidate and go, look, I hear and read and see and understand what your policies are and where your visions are. That's clear to me. They align with me, they don't align with me. You know, I'm going to put the one in the box there. Whereas if, and, and then you come out with the numbers and let's say Jager Jager has approximately eight candidates. Um, you're, they're each going to have certain percentages at the end of the voting. Surely the person with the highest percentage or highest number of votes would be winning the seat. Not always. But that's not how it works. No. <laughs> and, and look, this, that is a fantastic example of why people wonder do their vote count. Um, mm -hmm. Another part of that is what if the party that you feel most affinity for is not mm -hmm. running a candidate in your seat and none of the other parties you want to vote for. Um, you, you're asset, we've essentially taken that person's right to have a voice out. True. Or Good point. That, that's how it can be perceived. Tom, uh, I, I just saw you, you read this. <laughs> <out. laughs> it's interesting when you talk about America, because when Trump got elected, 48% of the people voted, which is an indictment of their system, I think. But out of that 48%, he got less than half that vote. But he mm. still was a, he was elected because he won the states he won and the way their system works is you've got to win the state. He just won some states, which gave him enough points, whereas Clinton clearly won other states by a lot, a huge margin. But you still only get, you know, whatever the points that state's worth. So I think that highlights how bad their system is. But you're right. I think our system does need an overhaul. Mm. Uh, uh, and, you know, the, the Clyde Palmer thing, I think, is obnoxious that someone who could just buy his way into politics, I think that's a terrible outcome. Um, too many parties running, I think. But then they, the current parties do need to be stirred up, I think. I think um, they are a bit. But then you look, the number of people joining political parties across Australia is falling off the cliff. Like, the number of members they've got is minute compared mm -hmm. to the overall top population but I think people do care but then when you say people don't think their vote will count if you're in a safe Labor or Liberal seat then you're basically right you know but I always still think it's important to vote because you don't you don't want them to think that they're in a super safe seat and therefore they don't have to do anything mm. but then it upsets me what's been upsetting me I've been getting upset every day now in this election when you see this the funds being handed out just on the basis of how marginal a seat is or barreling Oh, it's been deploying, and I think down Karangamite, I was down there on the weekend, and there's big posters everywhere how one of the, the Liberal candidates had announced $400,000 for a stadium upgrade. The stadium was completed last year, and she's got four hundred grand to add more seating and a new electronic scoreboard. And I'm thinking, well, surely there's a pavilion somewhere else in Australia that needs and desperately needs an upgrade. This brand new one-year-old pavilion doesn't need any more seats and a new electronic scoreboard, but that's what it's getting. Yeah. And then you see Michaela Cash and the Prime Minister out and the local member announcing a $200,000 extension to a BMX track. Like, 
is that's just buying votes. Yeah. It's not setting a vision. It's not having a plan. It's buying votes. Mm -hmm. And it's to the point now where everyone wants to live in a in a tight contestant. Exactly, because that's the only way you'll get anything. Yep. So um, is, is that good for our democracy? Well, no, obviously not. And I think, um, you know, one of the things that all this leads to, I mean, you can vote for a candidate as well. Now, you might personally know a candidate in an area and you might think that their values and what they actually personally stand for are why you would vote for them. Then they get toddled off to Canberra and suddenly party politics rules. Mm. That person has to compromise. That person suddenly doesn't end up doing things in Parliament that they may necessarily believe in with all their heart. And I think that, that part of that process, and here comes Rick, I believe that that part of this process is something that's creating this distrust of governments and parties where we're reaching levels. Should we be worried about whether we have a truly representative government and should we be worried that we actually have an effective government? I, I think it could welcome Rick, but of course we should be. But that's what the disappointing thing is, is they think that they're going to buy my vote because they're going to upgrade my sporting facility as compared to having a policy or an agenda that's going to do something about climate change or is going to provide more social housing for people, is going to provide opportunities for young people to get jobs. There's such a range of things they need to set that vision for. And by funding a sporting pavilion, and, and there was one out in Chisholm recently where one party came out and said, we're going to give five million dollars to the Hawthorne Footy Club for an upgrade of their facilities. And two days later, the, the candidate for the other party came out and said, we're going to give them seven million dollars. Like, is that what it takes to buy your vote? It's, it's yeah. just so wrong. Yeah. So Rick, uh, we'd love to get your views. Uh, what we were just talking about there was over the last um, 45 years, voter informal voting has doubled. Um, people who uh, people believe that who they vote for now doesn't really make a difference and that the levels of dissatisfaction are rising um, and that the level of people taking an interest in, in uh, elections is actually dropping because, and for whatever reasons. Um, would be very interested in your take on the current local election over the last and also then how you feel uh, Australia's electoral process has actually uh, run over the last 45 years. Do you think we need an overhaul? Yeah, so I didn't know. It's interesting to hear that the informal vote has doubled um, over the last 40 years. I wasn't aware of that. Um, yeah, obviously, that's the only way that people have an opportunity, in a sense, to express their disengagement um, in the compulsory voting system. So in other countries, people just won't rock up mm. to vote. Um, and, uh, and so then your turnout, um, your voter turnout is a good proxy of the overall level of engagement in the electorate. Mm. Um, here we've got the compulsory voting model. Um, I think most people in Australia would tend to have the view that it, it, it serves us well. Mm -hmm. I think the basis being that, you know, there's a lot of rights um, and privileges that come with living in a, a democracy. But one of the responsibilities or expectations is that, that you have your say and that you're part of the decision making process. Um, and I suppose then um, probably related to the increase in the informal vote and the disengagement is probably also the increase in the percentage vote of the primary that we've seen going to non-independents and the non-majors. So the two trends probably correlate quite well together. Um, I don't know if, um, you know, if that's a problem, if it's a bad thing, if it's a good thing, um, you know, maybe that it, it's, you know, the, the, the growth in independence is in response to providing more choice and more opportunity for people to, you know, a greater suite of options. Um, 
Yeah, at the local level, though, I think what we were really pleased about, I think, at the last council election is the overall percentage of people who participated in the vote, I think, was one of the highest on record for Banyul. So at least at the local level, um, I think we were really pleased to see quite a high level of engagement. That's a really interesting point you make there, uh, Rick. That demonstrates to me that people possibly feel more of a connection or an affiliation with their local council representatives um, rather than the state level or the federal level. Um, and be, probably because they can give us, they can ring us up and we can answer the phone or they'll, they'll get a response from us or they'll see us in the street. Uh, we're, we're a lot more accessible in local. Um, so that, that kind of makes sense. What you've just no, said makes, makes, makes I, sense. I, I hate to disagree, but. Okay. No, well, but you're going <laughs> I agree. To. <laughs> what, what, what Alison is saying is exactly right. What Rick is saying is exactly right. But I think the real reason was the first time we'd ever full postal vote. Yeah. That's probably why we went up. But to me, the last election I thought, was the most disengaged I've ever been during an election process. Um, and being postal, you know, it's like two weeks before election day, the postal votes go out, you're as busy as busy sending out things. COVID certainly didn't help either because you couldn't do all the normal things you do. You couldn't go and stand at a railway station. You couldn't go down the street. Mm -hmm. but, but then once the postal votes go out, the next week we did a few more things and then that was it. Mm -hmm. And election day was just another day like it was, you know, so i felt that, that we we did i know it's hard to go out and you know you're never going to talk to the majority of your residents you probably talk to five or six percent of them and in a normal time but i thought there was very little engagement and very little and you're putting out pamphlets you weren't getting much response back because people were in lockdown and yeah people were focused on other things i thought during the last council election and i know it was good to get that high result high turnout or voter rate but I, I didn't i thought the postal election took a lot of the interaction out between us and residents mm. yeah see what you're saying yep yeah. yep yeah, that was true too however if you're part of your community as a local councillor you're part of your community you're connecting with them every day every week throughout your term that 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 lockdown let's it was let that lockdown and that forced disengagement uh, to a degree, the personal, in-person disengagement should, shouldn't make as much difference. People will have made a decision likely by then because of the connections you've created throughout the term. But, but you're, you know, I don't disagree with it all, Tom, as, as a local councillor, yep, I, and a candidate at the time, I did feel like, oh, we should be doing this, we should be doing that, oh, we can't. <laughs> So, yeah, there was a lot less to do. And organising for election day was just frantic, trying to get all the booths organised, people organised to hand out, get your posts up. And then election day was just one of the busiest days of the year. Mm -hmm. And and by the time election day was over, you were just... And yet last election day, you woke up and think, oh, what am I going to do today? <laughs> it was just incredibly different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well... Both before, uh, both Alison and Tom before mentioned about vision and leadership. Let's have a little bit of a look at our history and how we'll go back to 1961, JFK mm -hmm. set the goal, a uh, an actual tangible goal that by the end of the decade, the US would land a man on the moon and safely return him to Earth. In 65, Singapore's founding Prime Minister, Lee Kuan Yew, laid out the strategic vision for Singapore. It was about, he saw Singapore as a vulnerable nation. All right, and so they had to be exceptional at certain things to maintain their place in Southeast Asia and survive. Today, Singapore is a major hub for IT, logistics and finance in Asia, and it's seen very much as a gateway. In the 1970s, Gough Whitlam, even before Kissinger and Nixon in the US, Gough Whitlam made a decision to open diplomatic relations with China, defining a 40-year path to stability and prosperity. Right now, those visions were long-term. They were gonna be there well after these people had left power. When we look at Liberal and Labor policies in this election, and you've both, meant, uh, Alison and Tom, you both mentioned how they seem so much alike. And they're also very much focused on the here and now. Things such as health, jobs, education, security. 
have both parties lost their way when it comes to setting an agenda for Australia for the next 50 years? A solid vision so that our children and grandchildren know what we're building towards and we know as a nation what it is that the rest of the world's going to come to us for. Who'd like to go first on that one? All right, I'm going to call and told Nick. Uh, Rick, sorry. Rick, you're going to go first. <laughs> I thought you were looking at Tom and Allison for that one. Oh, so. I, I was, but uh, you just had that that smile on your face. I figured you were ready to go. Um, so look, I think um, I think look, the reality is is, is that the political parties um, are responsive um, to a degree to what the electorate is looking for as well. So I'll answer the question, but I do wonder too, has the electorate's expectations and, um, and desires shifted too? Was, was it 40 or 50 years ago here where combined as an electorate, we were more willing and open to buy into long-term vision and to support um, parties and governments that were looking to do that? I'm just going to jump in there, Rick, because that is one of the questions we're going to ask in a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it's definitely worth worth exploring that one. But I, I'd really like to, you know. So, yeah, so then touching on that, I, so I think that, um, I, I think in some ways then, though, that the political parties are responding to the electorate. And I think particularly at this election at the moment, in moving out of COVID, um, but there's still quite a, um, lingering concerns around the health issues, um, the inflation and cost of, cost of living issues that people are grappling with, the cost of housing and the challenges for a number of people to even enter the market. I think a lot of people are probably in the electorate don't feel that they have a five or ten year time horizon. I think for a lot of the electorate, they're saying, hang on a tick, I'm worried about price increases and cost of living today. I'm worried about the housing market and how I get into it today. For younger people and climate change, we might look, I look at that as a still in, in some respects, a longer term issue. But I think our younger demographic in particular is saying, well, no, that is an issue for us today. So I think that what we're seeing in some respects is a political party focus on saying, well, we hear you. And that's why our focus now is trying to address what we see as the issues that you're facing today. But I do think that there is an obligation there from the major parties and the leaders to also be able to articulate a longer term vision. And I suppose maybe that is what's lacking a little bit because People want to see their immediate issues addressed. They want to see a plan for today. They want to know in the next six to 12 months. NDIS is another great example as well. If you're someone with a disability or a family with a disability, you're worried about your package and how that could be changed or reduced, et cetera. You're worried about that today. You're not worried about whether or not Australia can participate with America to help land a person on Mars in 15 years. So I think it's responsive to what people are going through at the moment, but I think that what you would like to see ideally is a response to those issues, but then an articulation of how we move to better and, and greater in the longer term. And maybe that is what's missing at the moment. Um, and that's why conversations like this are important to try and encourage that. And as maybe as local councillors, we have that responsibility as well to help encourage those conversations and shift that mindset. Hmm. Well, my, my concern, we, we look at the political cycle, but we also look at the economical cycle. And in this election, you have to say, no matter who wins, is gonna face a much more difficult economic cycle or environment. And, you know, NDIS, healthcare, aged care, they're all screaming for more money. Mm. The, mine, uh, the world, the mining boom hasn't come to an end. Prices are well and truly up, but that won't last forever. Food prices are up and that will last. So 
economic pressure on people is enormous. But what's also happened in the last few years, a lot of people borrowed a lot of money to buy expensive houses, which potentially will go into deficit. And, you know, they'll, and if it, as interest rates, like we're so vulnerable now to interest rate rises, people are just panicking a bit. And house prices are dropped on the rumour that interest rates are going to go up. What's going to happen when interest rates actually go up? So we're economically, we're in a much worse position. And the only response we had from the government in the budget, as I said before, was we're going to halve the petrol excise for six months. Well, that's not a long-term vision. It helps them short-term, but it doesn't really send the right messages either about, you know, we should we, we need to be more efficient with the fuel we have. We'll drop the excise, drop the price of petrol, and you can keep driving all these big cars as much as you like. Mm-hmm. How long ago we were all buying small cars? Now we're all buying big cars. So we're not sending the right... And, and you remember this time in the last electoral cycle, Labor came out for policy, we'll have all, all vehicles will be electric by 2030, and the, the Morrison government at the time laughed at them. You imagine if they had actually had that policy, implemented that policy, and were all much further advanced along the electrification of the transport industry, mm-hmm. petrol prices rises would not be such a shock. But, but we haven't, because we've tried to absorb all these, these and, and Australia's been very lucky because the mine boom has met we can make bad decisions and still live well. The time, I'm afraid, is coming when we can't continue to make bad decisions and continue to be prosperous. And I think that's where we are now. Mm. Alison? Carl, you made, you made the point about, say, Lee Kuan Yew uh, and his vision and, um, you know, JFK. I, I often think of um, um, Sir Winston Churchill <laughs> when he, in World War II and uh, his vision for winning the war and then he lost the election. I mean, <laughs> that's, as, that's as far back as I can think. Um, JFK, you know, set his vision and then the following year he was shot. I'm sure it wasn't the reason he was shot. There are other reasons <laughs> he was shot. He's no longer with us, you know. Um, does a vision... Oh, and then, you, you know, take Gough Whitlam. You, you mentioned Gough, Gough Whitlam in your notes to us. Well, look what happened to him <laughs> in 1974. Um you know, is there a message there as well that if we have a leader with a strong vision for 30 years, 50 years, 70 years, whatever it is, are they going to be shut down? So, Alison, I'm going to jump in there for a moment, if you don't mind, because mm-hmm. it's a great question you ask. Um, great leaders, strategic people, they actually sell the vision and they inspire others that even when they're going to pick it up and run with it. So, yes, Kennedy died in 63, two years after he set that agenda. But he committed not just the lunar agenda, he also wanted to commit a whole civil rights agenda, which was then picked up by LBJ and run through. And the 60s saw some of the biggest changes in American civil rights. Lee Kuan Yew, founding founding prime minister in 65, it was a 30-year vision. So other parties still picked it up and ran with it, other politicians still ran with it to get Singapore to where they are today. Mm-hmm. Now, yes, Gough Whitlam faced a blockage of supply, yeah. a double dissolution, and then finally a dismissal. Mm-hmm. But many of the things that he still stood for mm-hmm. were then still picked up and run with, and mm-hmm. while some of those have been watered down and still things like Medicare still get attacked and free university fees, unfortunately, went the way of the dodo, there were still other social changes that Gough brought forward that the Australian public believed in to put enough pressure on both sides of party, both sides of the political spectrum to maintain. So I'll come back to this, my next question then, which is, does Australia actually have a states person capable of setting that type of agenda and gaining that level of commitment? Because a great leader, a good, or even just a good leader, should be able to inspire people, sell the vision, and then have others take up the mantle after they're gone. Yeah, well, you're exactly right. And if you look at the last three Labor Prime Ministers that have won from opposition, you're talking about Whitlam, Hawke and Rudd. Mm. And I remember when Rudd came onto the scene and I thought, geez, well, this bloke, he's articulate, he's smart, 
he's setting up a vision. He's how good's this? We finally got, and it quickly turned to tears when he was elected. Um, yeah, he was a huge. Is that also part of the problem as well? That there's we're searching for these leaders, um, you know, the Messiah that's going to lead us all all to a better place. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that that's healthy as well. And I just look a little bit, you know, in, in the American landscape where they directly elect presidents, um, people think on the Democrat side when Biden came in, he's going to come in and transform the country. And I, I think sometimes, um, and I don't know, I look at, it's it, we, we need to move a little bit away from this approach of looking to the one individual to provide the leadership and maybe looking at the team um, mm. and maybe looking, um, you know, and if we look at, you know, JFK as an example, great vision, um, who made it happen? Oh, absolutely correct. LBK, um, and the relationships that he had built through the Congress mm -hmm. through many years as Speaker of the House. So uh, you, you are I suppose right. I've rambled You're on right. a little bit here, but I'm saying that I, I don't necessarily want to... I, I think we need to look more beyond, in some ways, just the front person, the leader, look beyond, say, for example, Albanese and Morrison look at the team, look at the whole offering, the whole package, because if we're just looking to one person to steer us through, I don't know if that's healthy and I don't know if we're ever going to get the outcome that we want. Mm -hmm. See, I'd sort of disagree with that to a point, Rick, in that a team is absolutely important, but every team needs a leader who can keep them on the same track because otherwise what you end up with is factions. And once you have factions that start to feel like they have to compete against each other and everybody's fighting for the prize, whatever that prize may be, they start to compete with each other instead of working together for the betterment of all. And that is a problem that we currently have with our political party landscape. We don't have a leader strong enough to keep the rest of the party in check. As Tom pointed out uh, earlier, just before you joined, the Liberal New South Wales Party is actively undermining Scott Morrison, because they know that if he wins the election, he will try and take over a lot of their own personal power as a faction. Mm. And that's been happening in Labor. You've seen it in Victoria uh, recently at the state level. Again, I agree with you. Teams and parties are important. I will never dispute that one person can, you know, there's no way one person can do it on their own but a true leader can bring all factions together and unite them to move down a path. And that's what I'm asking. Do we actually have anybody at the moment capable of being that? That is a true states person. I think if either party had a decent, inspiring leader, then that would be that we'd hands down. But I think Labor's recognised that Morrison is a better performer in public and speaks more confidently and in public and he's very good on his responses and very good, you know, that that quick question better than Albanese. That's why I think the Labor Party is now saying, well, a vote for Morrison is a vote for Barnaby Joyce because he's part of that team. And, and I think that resonates with a lot of people. I'm not voting for Morrison because I don't like, I don't want, particularly in Victoria, I don't want what's in the rest of his team. So I think that's powerful. And, and, I think that's why Labor's doing that. But I think if Labor had a decent leader, then there'd be no contest in this election, really. Given given Morrison does perform well and speaks well, but his team, I think, lets him down badly. And and when you've got Canavan deliberately, publicly coming out, saying something completely different to what they're saying, and then Sharma saying something different, and then the candidates down here in Victoria saying something different again, like it's just... It's, it's, it's pitiful, really. Alison? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hearing that there's, there's that lack of unity mm. amongst party, whether it's... I'll, I'll go with federal because we're, we're talking around the federal election. I am hearing that there's a lack of unity 
um, and therefore support for all of those party members within the states, within, within federal seats um, across the states. Um, and actually, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of getting that that because this year Victoria has both a federal election and a state election, um, there isn't really a sort of a clear cut, oh, these are the federal party members and these are the state later. We worry about state later. These are the federal members and these are the people. It's more Labor's Labor and this is what Labor's done in Victoria and you know, Liberals done this in New South Wales and that's therefore what they're going to be like for the whole. It's kind of this mingling of the party, no matter whether we're talking federal or state, the party's done this in Victoria and therefore it's going to be like this in federal and therefore I'm not going to vote that way in federal or I am going to vote that way in federal. Um, th but that's not actually what's coming across as you're, you know, some of you are saying, they're saying different things in different states and different, different um, regions and it's, it's therefore a lack of unity. Okay. Uh, but I'm I'm just coming back to your your expression, Carl, um, or some of the words that you've used today, or we've used today: inspiration, vision, um, you know, authentic leadership. That's really hard. That's a really hard thing for people to do: is continuously inspire enough people to first of all vote for them. And then secondly, continue that long-term, you know, that 50-year, that 30-year, that 100-year project. Because whatever, whatever it is, whether it's the health system or the, you know, education system or um, job creation, they're huge projects for that amount of time. And to continue for those projects to keep going for that 30 years, 50 years, and continue inspiring generation after generation, that's a big ask for human beings to do. So look, that's a great segue into returning for our last question to something that uh, Rick raised, which is, are Australians actually getting the government they need? Or with the rising apathy and distrust, are we actually getting the government we deserve? Look, I'll jump in because I think that Tom um, nailed it quite well earlier in his observation that um, because of the, I think that we had terrific government in the 80s and 90s, and I think the first term at least of the, the, co the, the, the Howard Coalition government was a good government. Mm -hmm. But really, for the last 20 years now, with the process of reform um, and economic reform and economic adaptation, um, you know, dealing with climate change as part of uh, an economic reform, that's really all, I think it's fair to say that we've, we've, there's been a lack of progress. So we've, to a degree, we've coasted off the reforms and the benefits of that period Plus then with the rise of China, we've then had the, the minerals boom to come in as a substitute. I think we're actually now getting to the point, and I, I think the next three years, I think the next period is going to be very challenging times to govern because we know that China's slowing down. We know they're entering a new growth phase where the minerals boom, there'll be potentially a lesser demand for some of our key exports. We know that we, we probably haven't run with the reform bowl for a while. So, but equally too, maybe they're the conditions, you need the burning platform, you need the conditions in order for reform and change to happen and in order for a transformational leader to be able to come in and make the case. And maybe the conditions just have not been right for that over the last 20 years because we have been in a relatively good position. And we know that when you do look to do a long-term vision, um, that it involves a bit of trade-offs and a bit of cost and a bit of sacrifice. That if things are going well, as they have been, people are unwilling to do that. But when things are, are challenging, 
and 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 maybe we're all experiencing a bit of challenge then i think that as a collective maybe we are willing more as a community to make those trade-offs and to hear that message so i suppose what i'm saying is i think potentially in a you know in a, a weird way that as we enter this period with a higher cost of living potentially higher debt burden um, reduced benefits from the mining boom that the conditions may actually present themselves for the right leader to make that case. But I just wonder if those conditions have been present over the last 20 years. That's a great insight, Rick, where it's almost like you're saying, by being the lucky country, we've been too comfortable to look to the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Alice and Tom, anything you'd like, you feel that you'd like to add to that? I fully agree with that because it upsets me in some ways that Shorten did have some of Shorten's policies last time I thought were quite good. And it disappoints me that it was my generation in a large way that voted not for, to bring in um, changes to negative gearing, which I think negative gearing is an appalling thing. And if you think interest rates have been 2% for the last three years, if you're ever going to remove negative gearing, the last three years was that opportunity because if you're never even gearing a property that you're paying 2% interest on, you're only getting a 1% interest uh, rebate. Mm -hmm. So that was the opportunity and that, that opportunity has been lost now. So there's been a lot of opportunities. That, and the other one was for, um, franking credits. And I, I know I benefit from franking credits, but I think if you haven't paid a tax on something, how can you possibly expect a refund? Yet it was clear in some of the some of the regions up in Queensland, particularly, the re, I don't think it was climate change or Bob Brown going up there in his ridiculous caravan. I think a lot of retire. If you look where the votes changed, it was in the retirement villages along the Sunshine and Gold Coast, where people clearly voted, "We don't want to lose our franking credits," and that was my gen and and yet, oh, so people voted so based on their own personal needs. And you're right, that's what's cost us badly. No one's setting for a vision and, and all they're saying is, oh, I'll vote for me and I'll reduce your power prices by $300. And someone else says, vote for me and I'll reduce your power prices by $350. Mm. That's not enough to influence me to vote either way. But clearly a lot of people don't get engaged and right at the last minute, which one's gonna benefit me the most in my day-to-day -day hip pocket at the end of the week, I'm voting for them. And, and we clearly need to get away from that. And the way to do that is have a decent leader, I think. Yeah. Someone that has that vision and people say, yep, I support that. I'll vote for them. It may not hurt, it may hurt me in the short term, but it'll benefit me in the long term and it'll benefit my children and it'll benefit our nation. Yeah, it's a great comment, Tom. I mean, one of the things I despise is both parties using the term affordable Medicare doctor visits. Because what's affordable to you may not necessarily be affordable to somebody else. And it's just a, such a vague blanket statement that really lacks a, specific, a specificity of target. You know, what are we actually aiming for? Alison, and, 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 sorry, I need, and an affordable housing pro policy that says we'll allow people to borrow five against a, a housing with 5% of the deposit. Yeah. They've already dropped this year more than that deposit. And yet, so people are borrowing more and more money, which they can't afford to pay on a 5% deposit and they're vulnerable people to start with. And yet that's, that's our affordable housing policy. Yeah. Alison? Mm. Um, I think you probably, I think we do. I think we get the government we deserve, but I also think it comes back to some of the language that's used during during campaigns especially, so let's go with that. When I look at words like fix Medicare, or, or sorry, expressions like fix Medicare or uh, one in Kuyong at the moment, the independent, chuck them out. Um, That's not the name. Make, make more That's stuff. That's not the name of the candidate, is it? Sorry? That is not the name of the candidate. No, no, no. She, her, one of her handouts is chuck them out. Right. With reference to the current Liberal Party. Um, fix Medicare, chuck them out, make more stuff in Australia. I'm just thinking, oh, is there something wrong with all of this? 
That's all I'm thinking. Oh, there's something wrong with our healthcare system. There's something wrong with this government that was voted for four years ago, three, three years ago, sorry. Oh, we're not making anything in Australia anymore. What's wrong with our manufacturing? And by That's what I'm getting. I'm getting, oh, I thought we were doing all right. I can still, I have a job. I'm putting food on the table for my family, but clearly there's a bigger picture and there's stuff that's wrong. Oh, I didn't know that. What's wrong? Is there anything we're doing right? Is there anything that's good? That, so there's just this negative blanket. There's this negative emotion, negative theme around this election. I'm going to go with federal election for the moment. Rather than we've done this, this is great, and now we need to get on and do this. Yeah. And are you willing to do this so that now in the next four years or three years so that we can have this in 10, 20, 50 years time. Now that, depending on how old you are, is gonna depend on the answer to that question and how you vote. Because in 50 years time, I will be here in 50 years time, by the way, I'm planning on that. But you know, there are people who won't be. So what do they care about 50 years time? they'd have to think about their own children or their own grandchildren to be able to get that vision for 50 years. So maybe we as voters and residents should be thinking long-term. Well, one thing I just wanted, just wanted to touch on was that when I look at the count, uh, us as a council and we don't have a directly elected mayor, so we don't have the the spearhead person who leads us every year, we get together as a group and we elect a new mayor. But if you think about what we've been able to do as a council, we adopted the, um, we said we we're gonna be carbon neutral in a decade. And we adopted that in 2018. We're 50% of the way there. That was a long-term policy that which would transcend three councils. We did the social um, inclusive jobs and social enterprise. We've had a very systematic approach now to our pavilions and buildings and, um, and upgrades. We do it with roads and footpaths. Look at what we're doing with waste now and with FOGO. FOGO is a long-term reform, you could call it, in the way that we're going to deliver waste services. We're looking at separating out the waste rate from the general rate in order to give the council more flexibility to deal with the waste issues that are going to present in the future. So I look at a lot of the things that we've been able to do as a council and I say, look, we've been delivering great outcomes in the short term for the community, but we've been making some very difficult decisions long term. We don't have the Messiah type figure there. We are able to come together as a group of councillors um, and our executive. And I know that a state government and then a federal government is much more complicated than a local council. And the level of scrutiny, you know, the, the scope of what they're responsible for, the level of scrutiny, intensity, et cetera. But I just wonder, maybe pose the question, are there things that we are doing that we could look, you know, that, is there things about the model that we've gotten right mm. that could be learnings at the state or the federal level? Yeah. I don't yeah. know, but... I think it's worth posing that question. Yeah. And I, I agree, Rick, that's a really, really good point. The examples that you've given show that things can be done in the long term. Yep. They can be done without any trouble at all. Yes, there were challenging questions and conversations and there were deliberations. And we know that certainly at council, our officers are working extremely hard to meet what was voted for and those, those figures and look at the benefits that are coming, especially with the Inclusive Jobs Program. Like that's just every six months, that is so exciting. Um, so yes, this shows that these processes can be done and these system and this vision, these visions can be created and they can be um, worked towards. Well, I agree with the, the, the obvious thing to change is fixed terms. Like we went through a month there where the only thing you heard about in the paper was when's the, going, the election going to be called? And we're waiting on a decision from the, the current Prime Minister. And it, it, was, it went on for a month that all we talked about was when's the election? Like, just make it a fixed term. 
you know the date, and then everyone can work towards that date. And the other thing is four-year terms is, is the obvious other thing to do because the way our, we, if things are going very well, the Prime Minister of the day can call it less than three years. Like He went to the maximum time this time, but if things are going well, he can call an election so he can ride the wave and get re-elected again. Mm. So let's have fixed terms so we all know where it is and let's have four-year terms because... Three years is just not long enough to do anything. I, I agree. So yeah, four years and a fixed date. So yeah. that's a good call, Tom. Yeah, and, and I think look, we've we've had we went from the the variable terms at the state level, where the premier of the day could call the election at any time, to the fixed four-year terms. And while you might not agree with everything of the current state government, one thing you do have to say is they have done some long-term visions. And maybe the four-year electoral cycle helps with that. Um, good call. Well, I'll tell you what, it's been such a great conversation. I know that we probably would could talk for another two hours, so maybe we may have to have another one of these, even leading up to the state one, because uh, oh, it, it really is... I love the insights. I love the insights and the different views here of, you know, is it... Is it our process? Is it our party? Is it our own individual psychological needs and acknowledgement of what we, you know, what we're looking for? Um, I'm not sure that we've actually answered any questions for, for any listeners to this podcast who are looking for some guidance for May the 21st. Um, but hopefully we've had them think a little bit more about what their potential choices are and what are out there. Uh, so thank you to all, all of you for that. Uh, any any last comments from anybody? My only kind of last comment is I would encourage people to take a lot of notice, think very carefully, and when they vote, vote for their children. Alison, Rick? I'll be following Councillor Malikin's advice <laughs> there. <laughs> good, good, good final call, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, Wonderful. and good luck. Good luck. Good luck on the top. <laughs> think about it before you've got. What have we got? Three weeks. Three weeks yeah. to go. Have a think about it before you um, read all your bits and pieces. Read the Facebook pages. Have a think about it. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, for your time today, Alison, Tom, Rick, uh, and thank you all for listening to the pod the Champion Chat podcast. Uh, join us next time where we will actually be talking and discussing Fogo, mm -hmm. food, organics, and garden organics within Banyul. <laughs> Have a wonderful weekend and uh, again thank you all for your time today. Thanks, Carl. Well done. Thanks for having us. Bye, Rick. Bye, Alison. Bye bye.